everyone. I know you are still joining us in the room, but I just want to get started. My name is Sunny Fridge, and I am an avid digital learner, and I'm so excited to introduce our guest, Kat Mulvihill is a skilled speaker, trainer, and facilitator. She's based out of Waterloo, Ontario in Canada. She has over 15 years of experience leading workshops and programs. And in addition to facilitating professional development sessions for teens, she also teaches how to create more engaging and professional online presentations. Please show some digital love to what I think is a YouTube Queen, Ecamm Live, and so much more. Welcome to the virtual stage, Kat Mulvihill. Welcome, Kat. Thank you so much, Sunny, for your warm welcome. I'm also going to ask, can we spotlight my, are you able to spotlight my picture? Because all of my graphics are in my little video there. So I just wanted to be able to ask that so everyone can see it. Um, Uh, Righty, I will work on that right now. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'd love to hear it for everyone who's in the room. So thank you for, for joining my session. I think that was a very difficult choice. And I would, I'm really curious about the other speakers too. If you can put in the chat, uh, just let me know how your, how your day's gone so far. I'd love to hear some feedback on how people are feeling today. How's it going? How are you doing right now? It's towards the end. So hang in there with me. All right. Okay. Long but fruitful. Yes. Some of these virtual meetings definitely can take a lot out of us, but when we're getting all of this learning and we're surrounded by these people who care about the same things, I think that's really exciting. Full of gratitude, stimulating, love the content. Oh, I love it. All right. So I can see my timer and my countdown and let's get into things. So as was so beautifully summarized by Sunny, I'm a, I am a facilitator and trainer and my name is Kat Mulvihill. And I was not always teaching about online presentations. (laughs) This is something that came out of necessity. So if we rewind two years ago in the spring, I had been in my first year of business trying to make a go on my own as a trainer and facilitator working with companies and everything shut down. And I had to figure out how to make my, turn my in-person workshops into virtual ones. And I really, I have... I have sat through some of the boring meetings and I've been in those painful Zoom calls where you just think, when is this ending? You're looking at your clock and you just, you're not feeling it. And I decided to jump into the YouTube wormhole and start learning how can I start to elevate these presentations? How do I level them up so that people are feeling engaged? Especially, I had a three hour training that was coming up in a few months And I thought three hours is already a long time to sit in a room together, let alone by yourself in front of a computer. So similar to the experience today, you want to make sure the people are with you and that they are engaged because what you want to avoid when you are the presenter is this. You don't want an audience of people who are just sitting there wishing that this would be over any moment and wondering what is going on. And when any of us are in front of the camera, when any of us are doing a presentation, That's not what we want from our audience. We want our audience to be engaged. Now, I like to preface and say, I don't believe engaged is equals participation. I think engaged means a person who is present with you. They are coming along for the ride. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're talkative or that they're on camera or that they're active in the chat but they are, they're with you and they want to hear what you have to say. And what I have discovered, and when it comes to especially a virtual format where you you can't always get direct feedback like you can when you're in a room, is that you can use a few different tips and techniques. And so I wanted to focus on seven tips that I recommend that people use when you are running a presentation, when you're in a room like this, or if you are running your own workshop or meeting. And so I've put these together and I really, I've grouped them into kind of three parts. And I really do want to focus on the ones that I think are actionable that you can do right away. So let's dive into them. And the very first one is sort of where I want you to start, which is this idea of defining success. And so when I say define success, I don't just mean for you as the person speaking, I also want you to think, what is success for the people in the room? What do you want them to walk away with at the end of it? 
What's the takeaway? What would it be? What would success be for both of you? So that mutual success. And I want to share an example. So when I think about sessions like this, when I'm invited to talk to a group, I want everyone in this group, success to me is that you feel empowered to start implementing practical tips, meaning things that you actually can do right away. They're not vague ideas or concepts, that they are practical, that you can engage participants on your next remote meeting, workshop, or speaking engagement. I want you to feel comfortable and actually excited to try something new and to try it right away. So I think that this is, you know, sitting down and coming up with defining success for both of you, you and the participants is the first place you should start. And that's a guiding principle. And it sets the tone as you are preparing for your presentation, but it also sets the tone as you are actually presenting and as you are engaging with your audience. And when you're really clear on that, then I think that's going to set you on the right path. Now, speaking of the start and the beginning and setting the tone, the next is to use something early, easy, and clear to engage your audience. Now, when I say early, easy, and clear, that's really specific. <laughs> when I say early, I mean right away. Easy, anyone can do it. Even on your worst day, you can do it. And clear that it's easily understood what's expected. In other words, engage the group early on with an activity that is easy to do using clear instructions. And I say this because, first of all, it sets the tone at the start to say, this is not a one-way thing. I am not just going to talk at you for the next little while. I actually want you to be part of this. I want you to be in the room with me, even if you're not in a room together. Easy is respecting the fact that everyone comes to the table with different abilities, different skills. And also, as I mentioned, on your worst day, sometimes we have a meeting or a presentation and something has happened in our life and we are not showing up as our best self. And it can be a lot to expect a person to maybe show up on camera and participate and engage and have a discussion. We're not all there all the time. So you need to appreciate that there are going to be people who just, you know, they might want to be there, maybe they don't, but make it easy for them to participate or be part of the group and without having to necessarily be really vulnerable or make someone feel uncomfortable. And so easy, make sure that everyone has that ability to do it. The other thing is clear. I think some people will consider easy and clear to be the same thing, but they're not. You can actually have a really easy activity, but you might not explain it clearly. And I really want to emphasize that you want to start off with things being clear. Because if you lose your audience, someone is likely to just disengage. They say, I, I don't really understand what is being asked of me. I'm just going to kind of shut down. And it's not always conscious. I've definitely been in meetings where I feel either excluded or invisible or just confused. And I'll just start drifting. Now, we're human. We all drift. I know that you're all going to drift during this, this presentation with me. I understand that but I think you are kind of pushed away when you are confused or when you feel excluded or that you can't participate in something. So I think that's another thing for everyone to consider. Now, my favorite way to engage with people at the start of a meeting, a presentation, or speaking engagement is a poll. And I'll use an example. Let's say I am doing a presentation on speaking and I ask my audience at the start, what presentation skill are you most interested in developing? Maybe it's working on verbal tics or filler words like ums and ahs. Maybe it's speaking without a script. Perhaps it's building confidence in your speaking or it's encouraging audience engagement. How do you get more engaged with your audience? A poll question like this serves multiple purposes. So if we think about the early, easy, and clear, I can put this up right at the start. I've covered the early. Easy, most of us know how a poll question works. There's one question and you have answers and everyone has to pick an answer that suits them best. It's also quite clear what I am expected to do in that situation. And 
This is something you can do either using a poll software, either built in, or you can use a third party. You can also just put it up or say it and ask people to respond in the chat. It's not overly complicated. You can even ask a yes, no question and have people use yes, no reaction buttons. But the purpose of doing a poll or the reason I love a poll, <laughs> why I think a poll is a powerhouse is that it also helps you learn about your audience. So you can ask questions that help you get to know your audience better, but you're also asking them to consider every single option on that list, which is actually a way of making them engage with your content. So if I was doing a session where those are four of the learning objectives for my session, I now have asked each person to read and think about every single thing that we're gonna discuss for the day. So I've also gotten them to engage with the content, I'm setting the tone and I'm let, getting them familiar with what they're about to sit through. So I love a good poll question. Now this leads me to the next tip. And the next tip is really around engaging the entire group, the whole group. It's very easy for a person to feel invisible, especially when you are in an online environment where if suddenly you feel like this doesn't necessarily pertain to me, or I maybe put something in the chat and no one responded or acknowledged it, I kind of feel invisible. I just put myself out there and now I kind of want to hide away. You know, we, as humans, we want to feel like we are part of something. And if you want people to feel engaged, you want them to feel seen, like they, they belong there in that room. So when you can do something to engage the whole group, regardless of someone's comfort with participation, that's really helpful. So I already talked about the poll, which is one of my power hitter favorites, but I also encourage things like using the chat box because even someone on a bad day or even someone who's quite withdrawn, maybe more introverted, they can use the chat. I also love the breakout rooms. <laughs> if you are running a workshop, I mean, right now we're in a breakout room but it enables people to be in these smaller groups, whether that's a pair where every single person gets to talk to another person in a smaller, more intimate environment where they don't feel as vulnerable. That's really helpful. Or maybe it's smaller groups, but it's a lot more impactful than having, let's say a really large group discussion where only one person can talk at a time. It's then very easy for someone to maybe disengage, drift away, or just feel like they're not being considered or heard. Another option might be something like a virtual whiteboard whether that's built in, something like Zoom, or maybe it's something like a third-party software like Miro or a GM board or a Mural. There are all sorts of great technologies where you can have people quietly interact and engage with each other in a way that's not necessarily putting people on the spot. And then also something simple like a reaction button. I've seen a few people use reaction buttons in the room. Most of us are getting comfortable using them. You may have to give some instruction on how to actually use it, but it is something that you can engage and everybody can do it all at the same time. And as I mentioned, there are, there are reaction buttons like simple yes or no, which gives a visual when people all say yes and no, and you can see the little checks or the little X's, but it engages the entire group. So everybody feels like they are part of it and they're meant to be there. So let's actually, recap these first three, because these first three are really about setting the tone and starting off on the right foot. So the first one, defining success. The second one, engaging your group early, easy, and clearly. And then also find ways to engage the whole group, because what works for one person won't necessarily work for another. And got to give my love to a poll question because it's just got so many reasons why it's so helpful for you and for the whole group. All right, the next two tips, these are a little bit more practical and I think you'll, you'll know when I get to them. So the first one, looking at the camera. And I feel like in a group like this, maybe this is a tip that you all know through and through, but I think it bears repeating because often, especially if we've got a lot of things going on around us and you know, we might be a little bit nervous or we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on a chat and people's reactions and what's going on. It can feel stressful to be looking at the camera and not be looking at the room. Now, unless you have a teleprompter, but even if you have a teleprompter and you can see the faces you're speaking to, you still can't see everyone directly through the camera. 
So what I, well, the reason I bring this up is that I notice with a lot of my students or people I run workshops with, their default mode is to want to look at the faces of the people they are speaking to. And I get it. You want to see the reactions. You want to see, are they with you? Are, are they nodding? Or maybe they're confused. And these are cues that you can use as a speaker to figure out, maybe I need to slow down. Maybe I need to stop for a question. However, when it comes to making people feel like they belong here, making people feel like you are talking directly to them, I don't know if there's anything more powerful than looking directly in the camera. And it is one of these things that is a subtle tip that many people don't even realize that it's happening. And I'll have workshops where people will say, I don't know why I looked at you more than other speakers. And I think it's because I'm looking directly at the camera most of the time. And this is both when you are speaking, but also when other people are speaking. So even if you have a group setting, like right now, we could have a conversation, I could have a dialogue, I could ask you some questions. And most people, their instinct is if someone else is speaking in the meeting, I want to look at that person's face. And I, I want to see their reaction. And I want to make sure that I'm following along with exact, exactly what they say. But when I am looking at them, I'm not looking at them. And so by looking at the camera when another person is speaking, it sounds like you are genuinely listening to that person. And here's, here's the truth for me. This is my truth. When someone else is talking and I look into the camera, most of the time I'm not seeing them. Yes, I have a teleprompter and I can put them up on the teleprompter, but I am actually getting more of their message by listening intently. I am hearing the emotions in the way that they are speaking. I'm hearing those vocal intonations. I can tell if someone is stressed or happy or relaxed or you know, angry, whatever that is, that comes through. Just like when we have a phone call, when we're talking on the phone with the person, we can sense all of those things. But by me looking at the camera and listening, instead of staring down at the screen at the person, I'm sending a message that I'm focused on you. And I actually focus more on a person when I'm looking at the camera and listening to them than when I'm looking at the screen. Because sometimes when I'm looking at the screen, I'll see someone else reacting and I'll then get pulled away. My attention will get drawn. Maybe I'll see something in the chat. Maybe I'll see someone's pet enter into their video, which is always adorable, but it's pulling my attention away. So I really, really advocate to look into the camera, both when you are speaking and also when other people are speaking. Now to address the, but I want to see their reaction, you can absolutely look down at the meeting or wherever that is in relation to your camera. That's okay, you can do that because you don't always stare 100% of the time always at the camera. That's, that's a little bit uncomfortable. But in a virtual setting, because of this physical safety net, like you know that we are not in the same room together right now. So I can actually get away with staring at you a little bit longer than if we were sitting across from each other at a coffee shop. If I was looking at you as much as I am right now, looking at you, you'd be a little bit creeped out. It's, it's not natural. When we're, in, when we're together, you don't do as much eye contact. But when you're in the virtual world, you really want to make as much eye contact as you can. I feel like I've, I feel like I've said my piece there. I think you understand why. Now, the actual practical part, I think, makes people nervous looking at the camera. Train yourself. Practice. Practice on your phone. If you have a phone and you're maybe on FaceTime with someone or having a video call, practice looking at the little camera and not the person on the phone. And just see what happens with your level of connection. See what happens when they're talking and you're looking through the camera directly at them and you're really listening to the words that, that they have to say. All right. The next one. This is another practical tip. Throughout your talk, using on-ramps and repetition to bring people back. Our attention will wander because we're human. We have thousands of thoughts every day. So random things might come into us, our heads when we're talking. Probably a bunch of you drifted when I was going on and on about looking into the camera. With on-ramps and repetitions, this is an invitation to come back, bring back your focus, or return your focus to me. and. But I'm also going to give you a hint of where we are. So I might recap 
what we've just talked about, maybe what we're talking about next. I may even say the words, hey, if you started multitasking, just put it down, come back to me because this next point is really important and I don't want you to miss it. You can invite people back and say, please come back to me because it's natural for people to drift. Now with these on-ramps, it's a really good way for you to be able to let people know where we are along the path. This works well if you've already set out what does success look like, but what we want to do is make sure that people are invited back on and they're not confused. Because I don't know about you, but I've been in meetings where I lose the plot and I think, I actually don't really know what we're talking about right now. I'm kind of lost. And if I can't figure it out, I sometimes check out and just say, you know what, I'm just gonna watch the recording later because I don't know what we're talking about right now. So I feel like maybe this is just not gonna land. So for you as the person presenting, let people have opportunities to get back on track and then they will feel like they're part of it and they're going to know where we're going. For example, recapping what we've done. So the last two tips, more practical, looking at the camera and using our on-ramps and repetition. For the next two tips, these are ones that take a little bit more preparation, but can have a lasting impact on making sure that your message gets through to your audience so that they're not only paying attention to you, but they're also retaining the things that you say. So the first one is to add visuals. There are many ways you can do this. Using traditional slides is a great example of a visual, can be really helpful for learners, especially ones who are not as strong with their auditory learning, learning and they are more of a visual learner. Also using things like graphics or the little roadmap that can be helpful. Using stock photography can be really helpful. It doesn't always just have to be words. I encourage you to mix it up. You can also do something like this, what I have right here on the screen by adding visuals. But you also can do other things like just put some words on a whiteboard. Now I have to say, anytime I've shown a whiteboard with my writing on it, factor in the time that it takes to write and be okay with your handwriting in order to show another group. Because every time I do it, I'm pretty sure it takes me at least eight to 10 tries before I get something I'm actually okay with showing another human. So I'm just gonna put that out there. But when it comes to the visuals, I want you to ask the question, how can I use visuals to support my key points? So supporting the key points, you really want to make sure you're not putting everything into your visuals. I'm 100% guilty in the past of having, you know, sit down and I start to create a slide deck and I realize I'm putting all the best stuff in the slides and basically writing my presentation using the slides. But then because you've put all the best stuff in there, when you show up, you just inevitably start reading all the best tips that are on the slides or in the visuals that you are using. So I'd really advocate, how can I have visuals that support the points I'm trying to make without actually being all of my best points. So I think that mixing it up using stock photography, using some text, but limited amount of text and using things like graphics that people can universally understand regardless of language. These things are all great ways to build something. And whether you put that in like I'm doing where I've kind of got it integrated into my video or whether you do a screen share, this can be really helpful for your audience. Now, the next one, this is something I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. In fact, moments ago, before we started this session, stories came up. Stories are extremely powerful. And when it comes to using stories, people will remember and retain what you have told them better in a story than they will without. And I think I saw some research not that long ago that shared People, you know, if you ask them two weeks later about a talk that they went to, if there was a story, they're more likely to remember what happened. The other thing is that stories are such an incredible way to engage your audience and bring someone along with you. And I remember, I think it was just, a year, just over a year ago, I attended a three-day-long virtual conference, all online. It was about 12 hours a day. It was a lot. <laughs> now it was on running virtual events. So it was actually really, really well-produced, high quality, lots of technology, 
it was pretty fancy. But on the second day in the afternoon, and you know, I'm starting to wander, starting to struggle. The speaker came on from his hotel room, no bells and whistles, no fancy camera, but he had all of us just riveted because he told such a compelling story. His name was Andre Norman, and he he just blew everyone away because they weren't relying on all the fancy tech. He just, he was telling a story and that story involved, it was about him, but it used some of the keystones of a good story. And so if you are using a story, first of all, practice it. Obviously, Andre had said his talk before he was well-practiced. He knew exactly what worked and what to say to keep us hanging on every single word. But you also want to make sure that you are using emotion and tension. These two elements are critical for a story. And if you don't practice your story, there's a very good chance that one or both of these will be missing and it will fall flat. And you want there to be a character, whether that is real, someone like yourself or someone else, or maybe a fictional character. But this character-driven story that has the combination of emotion, meaning do we care? Are we at all invested in this person? And then tension, the, well, what, well then what happened? <laughs> the curiosity of, well, okay, what happened next? What happened next? So that tension is really important. And so I think asking yourself, does my story include those two things? Because those are both very important and making sure you practice. I have definitely tried telling a story on the fly and it just fell completely flat. It did not work. It did not translate. I hadn't really learned about making sure that I have emotion and tension in my stories. And I think saying the stories over and over again helps them to feel more natural and just you hit on the right points and you can cut out the extraneous parts of your story that just aren't really relevant. But those stories, they're going to last with people. Those are the things that a really excellent speaker, you are going to be able to catch on to those. So those are the things that you really want to focus on. Okay, see the timer. See, it's going to close in two minutes. Which, as we wrap up, these are the seven tips. So we've got setting the tone, kind of starting things off. We've got our practical tips of looking at the camera and using these on-ramps, repeating things so that people can, you know, they might have missed it the first time. And then things that take a little bit more preparation but can really help someone to retain your message, which is the visuals and the stories. Now, I would also be remiss if I didn't tell you where you can find some of my content that was alluded to. I love to create videos on YouTube. Most of them are actually presented live, so the errors stay in there. But my website is catmulvahill.com and also youtube.com slash catmulvahill. I, you know, if you have any questions, I only have 60 seconds. So I really hope that you gained something from the talk today and that there might be an actionable, practical tip that you can maybe try at your next presentation, meeting, or workshop. So I want to say thank you so much for everyone for joining me for this talk today. Please show some digital love before you walk out the door, the virtual door. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> And yeah, speaker break at room after. I thought that was the case. So I think that, I can answer questions in a separate room. That'll be I don't have questions for myself. So I'd love to hear if anyone has questions for me. <laughs> I do. I see. Okay, see a few hands. I saw Diane's hand first. So Diane, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Kat. I loved your session. So many great tips. It was hard to write everything down. I just loved it. This is sort of a technical question. You had under your face or at the bottom of the screen, the tip. How did you do that? Yeah, so that is me using a virtual camera. Okay. And so the virtual camera, and actually, you know what's funny? I always check the, my, okay. Um, so instead of just choosing my regular camera, I have... Uh, I've created a virtual camera that has both my camera and I can add animations or text or overlays. So there are a few ways you can do this and or a few softwares that you can use to do this. And you're looking for a streaming software. So okay. I'm using one that's designed specifically for Macs called Ecamm Live, but there's also a free one that's available for both Mac and Windows, and that's called OBS. 
And that's actually something on my YouTube channel that I teach. So I have free tutorials on how you can set up your virtual camera so that you can bring in your graphics into Zoom meetings. Amazing. The only the only preface I'll say or warning I'll say is that Zoom has pretty low resolution because it's being used by so many people. They're trying to control the bandwidth. And so you really do want to make sure that it's large and legible if you are going to show it in your video window. There are a few workarounds for resolution that I kind of go into more detail. It would be a little too much to go into right now, mm -hmm. but I try to keep large, legible uh, graphics if I'm using them right in the meeting like I did today. Excellent. Thanks so much. So if I go to a YouTube and look you up, I could find a yeah. YouTube how to do it. I actually think I, there. I'll put that in there um, oh, in the chat. Fantastic. So, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And I have a little playlist. If you go to my kind of homepage, I think they're they're grouped into different ones. So I can also teach you how to make your graphics so that you can make your own graphics to go on top of your, your overlay as well. Excellent. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. All right, I see yes. Cynthia. Hi, thank you. I enjoyed this session, and especially how you started off talking about defining the success. I know in our club, we have a member that always says you need to add value and think of with them, like what's in it for me, but really it's what's in it for you. So I took that was my takeaway from that first part. But you also mentioned about looking at the camera. And I have my screen set up where you're the speaker. So you're the biggest screen that's showing. And then all of the gallery is across the top. And that's the only settings right now that I can have. So how do I make it so that way it's just you? And I am looking at you and not looking at anybody else because I've been trying not to look at the other faces, but they're there. <laughs> Well, you can, there is a little trick that you can do called dual monitors. So if you, if you, if you have zoom open, all of us have zoom open right now. If you go to your little zoom preferences, so if you open zoom preferences, which a shortcut, if you're on a Mac is the command comma will open up your preferences. The very first option when you open your zoom preferences or settings, is you'll see general and there's a little checkbox for dual monitors. So dual monitors will show you either the active speaker or if someone's sharing their slides or their screen, you'll see that. But that would be one possibility if you just wanna focus on the active speaker and not see any other gallery windows. But I would actually say when it comes to looking at the camera, I've just trained myself to just actually stare at the camera and not anyone else. So even if I'm not using a teleprompter, I'm staring at the little camera and I've trained myself over the last couple of years to the point where I even look at cameras when I'm not supposed to. So I have a Peloton bike, there's a little camera at the top. And instead of looking at the instructor, sometimes I find myself staring at the camera because I just trained myself always to look at the little camera lens and not look at people. I'll glance down to see people, I can see the names, but I really do just encourage you just to practice looking at the camera. And even if I have the Zoom meeting on my teleprompter, meaning I can see the participants in front of my camera, I still kind of stare right at the middle of the screen because that's where my camera lens is. If I were looking at different faces, I, you'd actually see me kind of looking kind of off to the corner because the, the center is where my camera is. So I just practice looking straight down the center. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay, I see Christine. Yes, thank you so much. While you were talking, I, I looked up your YouTube and I saw one of your, how do I do it behind the scenes? You know, what do I use and everything? And I thought it was interesting that you just said now that Zoom camera, if you use Zoom, it's not that clear. So what, when you're doing most of your streams, what are you doing it on then if you're not using Zoom? Oh, well, so I, I use Zoom for workshops and training. So anytime oh, okay. I'm leading a workshop, I will use Zoom. That's my that's my primary one. If I've been invited to a Teams meeting, I'll use that, but that's very rare. When I'm online going live to YouTube, I'm actually going directly from my streaming software. So from Ecamm Live, I go, I actually connect directly to YouTube. So it's a you get to pick the resolution. So in that case, I'm using 1080 
So I'm using a high definition going directly to YouTube. You can use higher resolutions, but they take up a lot of internet. So that's when it comes to YouTube videos, it will be a really high resolution because I'm not, not using Zoom to go to YouTube. Okay, so on your on your lives, on your slides, everything, do you have the slides? Um, I know you had them prepared in, in advance, but is it hard if you go live to YouTube to bring those slides up? I just had a problem with it. And so I, I stopped using slides because I didn't know how to get them up. It, is that easy to overcome? Have you been able to do that? Do you have a yeah. video on it? So I have a video on how you set up scenes using your streaming software, so OBS or Ecamm. And I do show how you can set up a scene that has slides and yourself. So if you want to have you beside your slides or just all slides, that's something that I do teach in uh, setting up your scenes in OBS or setting up your scenes in Ecamm. Both of those lessons will show you how to pull in your slides. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I see we've got just over a minute. If anyone's got a quick question or comment, happy to entertain any questions or comments. Can I ask another question then if nobody yeah. else wants to, so I'm not monopolizing. Okay. With the recap piece, is that the same process as the um, OBS software when you listed three at a time and then two? Is yeah, I, I just create, I created that animation. I use Keynote, which is a Mac uh, software. Okay. That's how I make most of mine. There are a few other ways you could do it, but I created that animation and it's an overlay that I bring into the streaming software. So you can do that in OBS. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. We've got 26 Thanks. seconds. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much. Yeah. Is there something else? I just want to say, Kat, it was a terrific workshop. I think one of the best that I ever heard. And I'm so Thank glad you. I chose you <laughs> not to <laughs> say anything about bad about the others, but really I got a lot out of this. And I will go to your YouTube.